Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And all scripture is God breathed. And it's profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. We say the spiritual spin yes, stuff right here because we really care for you. Steve, give us about 15 seconds or so to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the, uh, through the rebound technique and Operation Cry. You close out our prayer time and we'll move on to study. Father, we come to you this evening with great anticipation to learn more of your word, which will strengthen us in the spiritual battle called the angelic yes. conflict. Father, we know it's heating up, and right now, more than any, do we need the rightly divided word applied to the life, mm -hmm. and we need to spread it to other people who need it so bad. Yes. We have prayed that you preserve this nation so we will be able to still be a friend to Israel, to send out missionaries, to yeah. preach the gospel and teach your word and preserve the divine institution that you ordained for our nation to be. Mm -hmm. We don't take this lightly, Father. It's very serious. We ask you, Father, for blessings and mercy in the days ahead. We thank you for this ministry, especially for Dr. Jim and his passion for sharing these words with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, indicate that uh, tonight we're going to be starting with Philippians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And I uh, want to make just one announcement here, and that is on April the 10th, which is the second Sunday in the month of April, we will be meeting back at American Pie um, in, in North Little Rock. It's on Monmouth Boulevard, same time, same station, same agenda, just different message. The uh, fellowship this last Sunday was absolutely phenomenal. I think we had a good message, and good fellowship, uh, good attendance, and so I'm just inviting you to be prepared to come this uh, next month. Let's go on to our, our notes now. And the, the issue here in, in Philippians 2.13, the amount of time that I spent preparing this was just, just an, an, an unusual number of hours. And I don't, I don't say that to um, make you think something about me that is that I'm not looking for. It's just that I'm so concerned about making sure that I understand this, these passages in such a way that we'll get the most out of it. I want, I want you, I want you to be able to handle <clears throat> the word of God and handle life the way that God intends. Yesterday, if I, as I look back, from the time I got up in the morning and finished supper or finished breakfast, and uh, then went on, I think we might have gone out to lunch, came back and sat down and studied again. And I, after supper, uh, I just later on took my computer and went to bed. And at four o'clock this morning, I turned my computer off. And then I was up about 6.15 or so, and ready to go for a day. Now, I say that because I think that this passage here again, it, it's amazing. The more we study and the more we move toward wherever God's taking us, these passages are so relevant, Steve, that it's absolutely mind-blowing. So then in terms of trying to, to make sure that we just, it's just not a, a rush through a passage of Scripture. We're, what does this say to us? in the midst of all this. So let me start in verse 12, which is a, which is a, a review of what we did last, uh, would have been last Wednesday. This is what it says. He says, so then my beloved, and Paul is talking to the Philippians. And remember these Philippians now are, are basically, the, the, the majority of them are believers. They're in spiritual self-esteem. And Paul's looking for, forward to the time when they're, they're going to move on and move out of no man's land. 
which is where the Mac, where testing unbelievable goes on. And, and Steve, the testing is because you're living the Christian way of life. And we saw how, how the Philippians were persecuted, Peter was persecuted, Jesus was persecuted, Paul was persecuted, John was persecuted. Every, every believer at that point in time that had any significance was being persecuted. And what I want us to see is that that same, that same measure of attitude toward us is just waiting for us to get there. I go back to about 1978 or so, and I, we, were, we, were, uh, we were, I was friends with Gene Cunningham at that point in time, going to Conway. We had a ministry together, and nearly every time, every time um, Gene would, would teach in a positive way, he would warn believers that it's persecution down the road. That's what it is. And it's because it's the nature of life. It's the nature of the angelic conflict. So as you move forward and advance in the Christian way of life, this is what you can expect. So Paul says, so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not just in my presence, but now much more in my absence. So Paul's not there now. But these people are obeying. They're obeying the word of God. He said, be accomplishing the what? He said, be accomplishing your own preservation in danger. In other words, this, this idea of, uh, of preserving yourself, it's, yeah, well, I just need to eat a little more, you know, I mean, to stay alive another couple of, couple of days. No, he's talking about here, you're going to be faced with all kinds of opposition out here. And he says, you're going to have to preserve yourself. You're going to have to know the values of what you need to know in order to be able to maintain and move through that kind of that kind of danger. He says, so in other, in other words, uh, by accomplishing your own preservation in danger, in other words, Paul is saying, continue to advance. Move from spiritual self-esteem, move on into spiritual autonomy, because what happens is as you're moving, each time you advance to the next level, what you're doing is gaining capacity for blessing and capacity for greater suffering. And that's what the Christian way of life is all about. So he says, advancing with reverence, and that's with reverence toward Christ and respect toward Bible doctrine. Now, notice in verse, 13, in verse 12, he's talking about preserving yourself, recognizing the danger, the persecution for those believers who are going to go on. Now, what I want you to see in verse 13 then, with, that, with verse 12 as the background, the context, he said, for, for it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. I probably spent 12 hours on this verse. And it's because every time I looked, saw something new, I saw something different. And I wanted to make sure that we had this right, because here it is, you are, you are or you will be suffering persecution if you continue to advance. And the question is, if this, if this kind of pressure, it comes to your life, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to handle this? So he said, for it is, and that, for, that phrase, for it is, grammatically, it means for it keeps on being. Well, what keeps on being? It keeps on being God, and that's the Holy Spirit. It keeps on being God, the Holy Spirit, who is at work inside you. He's at work in you, but that means he's at work inside you. Now, this, listen, for it's God, the Holy Spirit, who is at work in you. Remember, he's, he's dealing in verse 13 with what he had just said in verse 12, where he says, work out your own, actually, the, it says, work out your own salvation. And there's, a, there, there's, there's a, a misunderstanding about that, and we talked about that. So he said, for it is God, the Holy Spirit, who is at work inside you, and inside who? Inside you as a believer, okay? And what's the Holy Spirit doing on the inside? What's he doing there? He says he's working inside you both to desire, and I think in uh, maybe in the King James Version or other versions, it's both to will, and, and what, we need, what we mean there, Marshall, he says both to will. In other words, what he says, I want you to be able, I want you to will something. 
I want you, and that word means desire. So he says, I want you to desire something. Believer, he said, I want you to desire something. And what is it he wants to desire? He says, both to desire and to work. And that means that word work means do. Here's, so you're going to both, both desire and to do what? For or according to God, the Holy Spirit's good pleasure. What does the God, the Holy Spirit want you to do? This is why there are times, well, do I go to the mission field? Well, I don't know. Uh, God, is God leading me to preach? Is he leading me to give? Is he leading me to? Well, listen, for it's God, the Holy Spirit, who's at work in you, both to desire and to work for, for his good pleasure. Now, remember, we're talking about the good pleasure of the Holy Spirit while you are back up in verse 12, working out your own salvation, working, working in, in, in dealing with the circumstances of your life. Now, let's take a look at this and see what he's saying here. In Scripture, what we need to realize in Scripture, in the Word of God, the phrase work in you is used several times. Work in you, okay? It's used several times. And the question is, what is it denoting? What, what is meant by this phrase that he is working in you? Well, it's used to denote a divine operation. In other words, if you see this phrase working in you, what you need to, what you need to realize is God's about to be doing something here. He's, he's going to be involved in your life. So he said the phrase work in you is used to denote divine operation that occurs in your human spirit and your soul. Now listen, this one of those, this one of those cases where when you're when you're dealing with the word of God, and uh let's say Let's say you are in, uh, uh, I invite you to come into a trigonometry class. And the, the problem is you're in the third grade and you just learned to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And the same thing happens in, in the spiritual way of life because there are levels of growth. There are levels of information that you're learning. And there may come a time when you hear something that's it's like you've just been, been drafted into the geometry class and you're still back there trying to learn how to subtract. But that's okay. We understand that. So what happens is if you don't completely understand this, you need to ask questions because this is a part of your life. That if you continue to grow in Christ Jesus, if you continue to learn to live for him in this mess, in this swamp, in this uh, septic tank of life, you're going to have to be equipped because, because of who you are. You are going to be persecuted. You are going to be troubled because of your belief. So the phrase work in you is actually used to denote a divine operation in the human spirit, in your human spirit, and in your soul. So what you need to realize here is that as a human being, as a born-again Christian, you have three parts to your being. You have a physical body. You have a spirit, human spirit, and you have a soul. And all three of those are operational or have some function in your Christian life. Now, watch what he says. He said, this working in you. So when, when Paul says in verse 13, for it is God, the Holy Spirit, who is at work in you. Now, understand here, you're being persecuted. Let's assume for a moment you're being persecuted and you're looking for answers. And what you need to realize is, is that the Holy Spirit who lives in you is going to be working with you to get you information on how to deal with the circumstances that you're facing. So here it is. Now, what is this? The, the phrase work in you is used to denote a divine, in, a divine operation. Let's look at some verses of scripture and see the divine operation. In 1 Corinthians 2, 6, 12, 16, it says there are a varieties of effects. In other words, these are these are results, results that happen in your life. There are a variety of, of effects. He says, but watch this. He said, but it's the same God. You, you, you know God's divine. He's deity. So watch what it says. But the same God who works all things in all persons. So you see here what he's saying here. There are a variety of effects. So there, you've got this effect out there. You've got this effect out there. You've got some big, another effect out here. And here you are. You're relating to all these effects. You say, what am I going to do? Well, while you have all these effects out there, you need to know there's only one God, the Father. He's known about you since eternity past. He has a plan for your life to deal with the circumstance that you're facing right now. But it's the same God, the Father, who does what? The same God, the Father, who does what? 
What's he do? Who works all things in all persons. You know, let me ask you this. If, are you a person? Do you have any idea of what this means then? When you find yourself in certain in certain effects and certain things out here in life and you're looking for an answer, just realize that that same God who worked in that person over there is going to work in you to bring about a, a solution that would be a divine solution. So the idea here is what we're seeing is a divine operation in the life of somebody. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 11. But the one and same Holy Spirit. See, in verse in verse 6, it was God the Father. But, but one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually, just as the Holy Spirit wills. Now, what does that mean? Here you are, you find yourself in a certain circumstance. God, God helped out over here. Now, in verse 11, Paul's telling us the Holy Spirit has, some, has a function here also. But one and the, and the same Holy Spirit, what's he going to do? He works all things. And what is he doing? Distributing to each one, that you, whoever you are as a believer, distributing to each one individually just as he wills, not as you will. But as he wills, remember we're we're working we're working in God's plan and we're working for Him. We're not working for ourselves. So He's going to distribute to us as He wills. But the idea in verse six is here is here is divine uh, divine um, a divine operation in your life. Let's go on to the next verse, Galatians two eight. Actually, what we're seeing here then is a divine operation. In 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 in, uh, in working out in Galatians two eight it says for he the Holy Spirit let me ask you a question where where does the Holy Spirit reside where now if if you're a born again Christian if you don't understand this the Holy Spirit is living inside you inside your human spirit right now okay he's there so it says in Galatians two eight he the Holy Spirit who was at work for Peter, okay? So you're looking back to Peter and Peter's got a ministry out there and um, Peter has a need and up, up comes the Holy Spirit. And he says, look, I got this thing for you, Peter. He, the Holy Spirit, who was at work for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised was at work for, was a work for me, Paul, also to the Gentiles. So what happened is as Paul, as Peter was working among the Jews, Getting them the gospel, getting them, trying to get them saved, become Messianic Jews. Uh, he'd run into run into circumstances out here where he needed some guidance, he needed some help, and the Holy Spirit. Whoop! There he is. The Holy Spirit's there to give him that help. Paul says, "Look, the same Holy Spirit that helped help Peter is going to help." And actually, he helped me. Now, I have a question: If the Holy Spirit helped Peter, and the Holy Spirit helped Paul. Who do you think is going to help you? The same Holy Spirit, because we're, we've got the same operation. We have we have the same ministry. Get the word of God out. Get the gospel out to get people saved, and get the word of God out to teach them. Now in Ephesians uh, in Ephesians uh, one eleven. Now th remember again, going back to the beginning, going back to this particular point, what we're seeing here is the concept of a divine operation. God is at work. Okay, now in Ephesians 1.11, it says in him, and in him means you're saved. You're not in Adam. You believed in Christ, and now you are in Christ, which is him here. In him, that means now that you're saved, we also have obtained an inheritance. Because you are a born-again Christian, God has an inheritance, an inheritance for you. Then he says, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things. Now let's go back here. If you're, you're you're born again, you have an inheritance, and it says having been predestined, which means God in eternity past determines something ahead of time, having predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things. And so, in other words, whatever God's purpose for you, it's according it's according to God who actually works all things in accordance with a plan of his will. So God, is, God is, has, has already has designed for you the things that you need to carry out your Christian way of life. 
in Ephesians 1.20, it says, which he, that is a reference to God the Father, which he, God the Father, brought about in Christ. What did God the Father bring about in Christ? In other words, he used Jesus Christ to bring something about. When he, God the Father, raised him from the dead. Okay, let's let's take a look at this again. God the Father brought, brought about in Christ. God used Jesus Christ to bring something about. And what did he do? It was associated with the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So Jesus Christ came and he went to the cross. He was born of a virgin. He lived 30 years. He went to the cross. He died twice, spiritually, physically. Then he, they, they buried him. Three days later, he came out of the grave. And that's what he's talking about here, which God the Father brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. In other words, out from among the dead, out of the grave, Jesus comes and seated him. It was 40 days later, he was crucified, dead, put in a grave. Three days later, he came out. And 40 days later, you look up and there he goes. He ascends into heaven. And what, where is he? And he's seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places. Now, what do we see in these verses? It, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 16, 12, 11, Galatians 2, 8, Ephesians 1, 11, and Ephesians 1, 20. What we see in this in these five passages is this. This phrase at work in you indicates that there is a, a divine operation in your life that takes place in your human spirit and in your soul. Okay, now you say, okay, that's fine. The Holy Spirit's working in my human spirit. He's working in my soul. Can you explain that to me? Yes, we can. Let's talk about that for just a moment. And point number two says we believers must understand where the Holy Spirit resides and how the Holy Spirit works inside of us. This is extremely crucial because see this divine operation that's going on. If you don't know how God the Father works, if you don't know his relationship to the plan, if you don't know Christ's relationship to the plan, if you don't know how the Holy Spirit working in your life, again, you're, you're going to struggle out here uh, looking for answers and there won't be any. So we believers must understand where the Holy Spirit resides and how the Holy Spirit works in our uh, works inside of us. And here's, here are four points that are going to tell us those, those things. First of all, the Holy Spirit resides in your human spirit. Every born again Christian has a human spirit and the Holy Spirit resides in there. Why is he residing in your human spirit? It's because that's where God put him. He says, this is where you're going to live inside a born again believer. Secondly, in our human spirit, the Holy Spirit does several things. Three, uh, for, for sure. What does the Holy Spirit do? He teaches you. See, that's why when you come to Bible class, what do we do? First, first thing we do before we before we start class is to rebound. We we if we have any sins that we need to confess since the last time we had a time of confession, we confess them. Guess what? The moment you confess the last known sin since the last time you had a time of confession, you're clean. It's just like taking the whiteboard and have it all marked up with the dirty signs and numbers and stuff like that on there, and you take a a cloth and you just wipe that thing clean. It's shiny clean. That's what happens. That's what God does to your sins. He wipes them away. He doesn't even remember them anymore. So now that you're clean before the Lord, that's why we use Operation Cry to get inside the sphere of the spirit, which is where we are to be living. Now, when you are, when you're as a born again Christian, you're living inside the sphere of the spirit. Now you are in the, you are in the position where God, the Holy Spirit can now teach you. And you don't have to have a, a 180 IQ to be taught by the Holy Spirit. You just need to listen to what he's saying. Now, you're gonna, not going to hear with these, hear a voice, but you're just going to know that you know that you know the light turns on, bingo, the light, that's the Holy Spirit dealing with you, okay? So he teaches us. Secondly, he bears witness with our spirit. He's going he's gonna, to uh, gonna lead you. He's going to guide you. He's going to confirm some things, and that's the next point. He confirms truth to us. Uh, Lord, I'm not sure. Should I do this? I, I've been struggling with this for so long, Lord, I don't know. And all of a sudden, wham, that is you know, you know, do you know for sure? This is what God wants. Where did it come from? 
That's the Holy Spirit confirming this in your human spirit. This is how it works. It's invisible. Not a matter of some kind of an experience. This is the spiritual way of life. You say, well, I've never experienced any, anything like that before. Then you haven't moved along far enough in the Christian way of life to know this is how it works. This is not spooky. This is not, uh, you know, this is not some kind of a, a goofy religion out here that, uh, no, this is biblical. This is God's plan. Just read it for yourself. So the next thing, point three here, the work of the Holy Spirit in our human spirit, the Holy Spirit in our human spirit leads to the metabolization of doctrine. So when you, here you are, you're in class. And guess what's happening now? Um, Annette and Janet, because we've had a time of confession and you have yielded to God, the Holy Spirit, what happens now, I, the, word, the word of God, here it is, the word of God's right here. Got right here, but I've got it on paper now. This is doctrine on paper. This is the word of God. Now, what I'm doing is I'm communicating. It's coming out of my mouth. It is coming through your ear, and on your page, it's coming through your eye. And where does it go? It goes straight through the ear gate, eye gate, and it goes right right into the left lobe of the soul's mentality, where you have where you have a, a, an area there where the word of God comes in. And you have to ask yourself, do I understand what Jim is telling me? And when you when you know that you know that you understand what is being communicated by a pastor teacher, yes, I understand. How do I know you understand? Tell me what I just said. So when you tell me what I just said, that's an indication you know you understand what I said. Now the question is, what are you going to do with that? Well, because you're clean before the Lord, it's like pouring water down a drain. And if you pour if you pour water into a sink and it's got the stopper in there, there's nothing going to happen. But if you pull the stopper out there and pour water down that drain, it's going down the hole. It's going into the sewer. Okay. So what happens when you're clean before the Lord? The 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 uh, the Word of God when it's being taught coming into the ear gate or eye gate. Into your into your left lobe of the mentality because you're clean. It goes straight down into the human spirit, and guess who's living there? That's the Holy Spirit. Guess what He's going to do? He's going to teach you the meaning that I've given you. I'm telling you this. You's not you're not getting it. You may not understand it. It's not clear yet. But as the Holy Spirit deals with that, it all of a sudden becomes clear. So I'm teaching you, but until the Holy Spirit confirms that for you. All you're doing is, is is telling people what I said. And that's why when the Holy Spirit, Steve, when the Holy Spirit teaches you, you don't have to say Bob Thiem said. You don't have to say Gene Cunningham said. You don't have to say Dr. W.O. Watt said. You don't have to say something Jim Bertell said. It's, the, it's God said. The Holy Spirit taught me what this is. And now you're not plagiarizing, see? You're, you're giving just exactly what you now know because of the work of the Spirit. So the work of the Holy Spirit in your human spirit leads to metabolization of doctrine in the right lobe. So it, when it comes back to the left lobe, you believe it, and it comes right over here, and it's stored now as information that you can actually use out here in your circumstance of life. Now, point four says he provides a, the Holy Spirit provides a sphere in which we as believers are required to live. What is the sphere that every one of us are required to live in? The sphere of the Spirit. And how do you get there? To rebound and what? An operation cry. And when you've used God's plan, guess what? That's where you are now. You are in the sphere of the spirit. And what we're talking about here is a divine operation. Now that you've got all this, God can operate within you to give you what you need out here. Let's move on from here now, just a second. In point three, now what we need to do here is we're talking about God, the Holy Spirit working in you, God working in you. We've got things to do out here. We don't need to be doing this on our own. God needs to be working through us, okay? Now watch this. In point three, you need to be careful because here's what the verse says, Steve. It says, for it is God who is at work in you. Now remember back in verse, back in the previous verse in verse 12, we are, we are to work out our own salvation. See, you are to work out your own salvation. So you got you have a set of circumstances. You're wondering, what do I do in this thing? Look at this pressure, uh, Paul. Uh, Paul, do we need to jump? Do we need to go over the wall? Do we need to go hide somewhere? What do we need to do, Paul? 
See, God's going to lead you in all this. So what we need to do is if we're working out our own salvation and we get into verse 13 and it says, but wait a minute, it's God really who's working in you. Now watch. Here's what happens. Uh, here's what happens, Marshall. When 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 people see this, for it is at God, it is God at work in you, you find the Bible says, do this, do that, do this, do something else. Say, oh, yeah, that's fine. I see what I'm supposed to be doing, but hey, I'm just going to sit back now because God's working in me. For it's God who is working, is at work in you. So the idea that people get then is, wait a minute, if God's doing it, I don't need to do it. So this is going to be a misinterpretation if you believe that if God's working in you, you don't have to do anything because he's the one that's doing the work. See, that's an error. But you're going to be working out your own salvation. You're going to work out your own deliverance. But you need to realize that God is at work in you. What in the world is that going to mean? But let's take that phrase and, and look at some things. God the Father does not act for you. Now, what to, if, if I said that to you, if I said God the Father does not act for you, well, if he doesn't act for you, who's going to act? Who? That's exactly right. See, that's the idea. God, see, for God, it is God who is at work in you. But the, when that phrase doesn't mean God's acting for you. Oh, no, he's at work in you, all right. But you have to act for yourself. This is why when we say the Christian way of life is not just a matter of getting saved and waiting for the sweet by and by. No, no. No, now that you're saved, God has a plan for your life and you need to be doing something. So God the Father does not act for you. But we have a question then. If God the Father doesn't act for us, what does he do? If he's not acting for us, what does he do? And here are two points. What does he do? He influences us to be motivated to do his good pleasure. So God has a good plan for you out here. And he says he, he's, at work, he's at work in you, but that doesn't mean he's going to do your job for you. You're going to have to do it for yourself. But what's he going to do? He's going to, mo what he doing? He's motivating you to do what he wants you to do. Now, the question is, if he's going to motivate you, where does the motivation come from? B-D-R-I-S. Bible doctrine resident in the soul. That's right. So the truth of the matter is, God is working in you. But he's, in, he's influencing us to motivate us to do something out here for ourselves. So his working in us is the work is moving us toward the word of God. Second point here, he influences. Let me read those two points together. He influences us to be motivated to do his good pleasure. He, he influences, but what do we do? He influences, but we act for ourselves, which means then in the Christian way of life, if you are a born again Christian, God wants you to do, he wants you to swing into action. You're going to think, you're going to feel, you're going to speak, and you're going to do the things that Christ wants you to do. You're going to do them like that. See, that is your action. Now, God the Father does not compel or force us against our will. Now, stop and think about this for a minute. You say, wait a minute, God's omnipotent. God is omnipotent. He can do anything he wants to. I'll tell you what he can't do. He can't force me to do his will. He can't force you to do his will. He's omnipotent, but he can't do that. So while he's, while he's attempting to force you to do your will, <coughs> let's, let's suppose he just keeps knocking on your door, okay? He knocks on your door. He, my goodness gracious, I guess I'm doing something wrong here. Let me get this thing straightened out. Let me do the right. No, I'm not going to do it. He knocks again. Then he knocks a little harder. He knocks a little harder. And every time he knocks, you say, no, I'm not doing it. You're not, you're not going to force me. You're not going to compel me to do your will, God. Now, that's a possibility. But what's the, what's the end result for you? What, 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 is, what is the assurance that he cannot force you to do his will? What's that? Well, the, your relations in your relations in, but what is the what's the final straw that breaks the camel's back? There you go, you're dead. And and he, 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 the sin of the death. 
He just keeps pressuring, pressuring, pressuring. He said, no, 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 no. The point is God can't compel you. He can't force you to do his will. You have to make a decision to do it. Okay? But when you, when you choose not to do it, there comes a point in time where God says, okay, royal ambassador, it's time to come home. And away you're gone. So let's move on, move on here then. He cannot compel you to do uh, or force you to do his will. He leads us to desire as well as to do. In other words, that's what God's doing. He's, he's working in us. He's working in us to desire, to desire to do his will. He will, he will, he, he will, his will, his will, what God wants you to do, his will cannot be forced upon us against our will. I've just explained that. Now, the meaning here is that God the Father exerts such an influence on us to make us willing to obey him. In other words, God, God continues to influence, influences, <clears throat> influences through the word, influences through a set of circumstances out here. So whatever God's doing out here to influence us, he's going to do that so that, so that we will come to a point where we desire to do his will, that is to obey him. Look at Psalm 110, verse 13. And again, the idea here is God is going to exert influence on us so that it makes us willing to obey him. Look at Psalm 110, verse 3. Psalm, and this is just the first half of this verse. Psalm 110, verse 3 says, on the day you fight your enemies. Okay, on the day you fight your enemies, your people will do what? Your, your people, on the day you fight your enemies, your people will volunteer. Listen, I, it's amazing. This is what's happening in Ukraine right now. They're getting ready to fight their enemies and what their people doing. Their people are volunteering. That's just an example. Just an example. That's all that is. But the idea here is your people, when God is influential in your life, you will, you will make a decision to be obedient to him. And that's why, that's why it says here, on the day you fight your enemies, your people are not going to run. They're not going to lay down and roll over. No, your people will volunteer. That means they freely obey. Like the dew of the early morning, your young men will come to you on the sacred hills. Now, in point four, God working in us to do his will. What does that mean? God working in us to do his will. That cannot mean that God compels us. Here's the issue. We remain free agents. We're agents that have free will. We can do what we want to. Although he works in us to will and to do. He's going to influence us to do what God, what he wants us to do. Now, it simply means that God, the Holy Spirit, exerts such an influence on our lives as to secure this result. And what is the result? Is to do his good pleasure. Now, what's the whole point here? The whole point in this is, is that going all the way back to the beginning, he says, for it keeps on being for uh, for it keeps on being God the Holy Spirit who is at work inside you as a believer both to desire and to work to do according to his good pleasure now let's move on from here Philippians 2:14 now this is another verse that took equally equally a the, the same type of number of hours to see what is going on here in this verse, and it's very short. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now, before we even get started in this verse, Marshall, do you understand that there's a lot of pressure on all people, believer, unbeliever, it makes no difference. There's all kinds of pressure on people today. Would you agree with that, Steve? Amen. Cody, would you agree with that? Janet, Annette? All kinds of pressure on people. What, what is it? Is it the price of gasoline? 
what is it? You go to the, you go to the store and you find out that there's several things there that you you really want. They used to be there, but they're not there anymore. What is it? You're looking for a job, but there's no one out there has a has a job for you that will be worth uh, worth taking because it's not enough money to live on. What's the matter? Are you sending your are you sending your children to a public school, and now you're finally finding out after all these years your children in school, and you can't figure out why they've gone astray, why they've gone out in left field, and now you're finding out what they taught your children for the last twelve years. So you send them off to college and find out why after they go to college they've gone out in, in, into the Thule somewhere. What else is going on? Is it your medication? Uh, what is it? Things are happening in life. Now listen here. So what happens is, oh my goodness, Marshall, I haven't been able to find a job, Marshall. I'm just so whooped down here. I just, God, why don't you give me a job? God, it, it, we've got all these things going on. And the question, Marshall, is how are you handling it? And that's what this man told me at the gas station today. He was talking about, listen, We've got all these things going on. He says, it's unbelievable how people are handling these things or how they're not handling them really. And here's the point. And I want you to think about this. And quite honestly, I don't have anybody in particular mind. I don't have anybody in particular mind. But I'm telling you, I may not know. He said, do all things without murmuring. Everything you're doing, doing it without murmuring. Now, he said, do it, do these things without murmurings and disputings. Now, let me show you something. That word, that word murmurings in the Greek, it's translated in the English Bible. That word murmuring is translated two times, the Greek word translated two times, complaint. So do all things without complaining in two different areas. In another, another place, in a, two other places, it said do all things without grumbling. Now, I want to ask you something. Do you know anybody that murmurs? Hold it now. Do you know anybody that complains? Do you know anybody that grumbles? Now, here's the issue. What I'm, what I'm asking you is I want you to hear this because God said do all things without murmuring. He doesn't say do a few things. He said do it all. Do it all. And without disputing. Now the word disputing here is used one time, it's translated one time argument. So do all things without arguing. Another time is translated disputing. Do all things without disputing. Then another time it's, it says do not uh, do do all things without uh, without dissension. Then he says, do all things without doubts. That word's translated doubts one time. Then it's do all things without motivation, without motives. What kind of false motive do you have? Do all things without opinion. Do all things without reasonings. Oh, let's see. I, I hear what you're saying, but let's talk about this. Let's think about this, okay? He said, do all things without speculation. Do all things without thought. That's three times. And that means, and it also translated, uh, do all things without, without what, what, what thing are we thinking about here? Okay. So here's, here's two things. He said, do all things without murmuring and do all things without disputing. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about this idea of do all things without murmuring. Okay. That word murmuring again, what do we do? Without complaining, without grumbling. Are you a born again Christian? Are you living the Christian way of life? Listen, I'm 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 coming through strong, okay? I don't have any other intention except look, I want you to understand what he's saying here. This is your Christian life. This is not religion. It's your spiritual life in the angelic conflict. It's not about what you're doing. It's not about this over here, not about this over here. It's about your Christian way of life, functioning in the angelic conflict without being distracted over here or over there or someplace else. Keep on doing everything without murmuring, complaining, or grumbling. Now, watch this. 
What, do, what does God say about murmuring believers, believers who murmur? What does God say about that? Let's look at let's look at Exodus chapter 16 verse 1. Just reading it. It says and they took their journey from Elam. Now here's what you want to get that more we're going to change the tape right now. Thanks folks. Okay, now I want to ask you a question. Not not deep not a deep question. I'm trying to trick you. The Jews have come out of Egypt. Where are they going? Where are they headed? Headed for the promised land. So they're they're in this they're in this journey from Egypt to the promised land. Now what happens? It says they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin. Now that doesn't mean it's a, a sinful wilderness. That that's just the name of it. Okay. They came unto the wilderness of sin. So they left Elam and they're, they're out here now. They're, they're in this wilderness, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they're departing out of the land of Egypt. They've been, been traveling now for a little over two months. Said in the whole congregation. Now, let me, under, let me help you understand. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of believers they came out of Egypt. Every person who came out of Egypt was a born again believer, not a Christian, a born again believer. So now you have these believers. Oh, they should be. Oh, they should be on top of things. Oh, they're a believer in Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Look here. What wonderful people these are. They get out there in the wilderness and says in the whole congregation of the children of Israel, what do they do? They murmured. They complained. They griped, they bellyached against whom? Against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Moses and Aaron were their leaders. And now they're bellyaching about their leaders. Do you work anywhere? Do you work for somebody? Do you don't like the things that you're doing? How are you handling the job where you are? Are you bellyaching? Are you griping? Are you moaning? Are you groaning? What are you doing? Please. Listen to me, folks. He said, do all things without murmuring. You murmur when you go to the bathroom? You murmur when you go to the sink? You murmur when you're in the car and the gas is, don't have enough gas to get there? What's that? Yeah. Please, I, I, I listen, I'm talking to you. This is the Christian way of life. Look at your life. I'm looking at mine. You look at your life and look at all that's going on. Look at what's going on in your job. That's what now? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Steve, this is where awareness, alertness and awareness comes in. You alert of the circumstance and you're aware that you're, you're alert. And, and here comes this, here comes this circumstance. But now look, instead of complaining and griping and moaning and groaning and marabine, listen, God has a plan for your life. The people around you need you. They need you. And they're not, they're not, they're not going to want your Jesus. If you, oh, well, oh, no, hold it. This is your life. Understand, please. He said in the whole congregation, it was just a few, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, their leaders in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, so the children of Israel said to Moses and Aaron, they said to their leader, what did they say? Would that God we had died by hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Oh, look what happened. We, we, listen, they were in Egypt for 400 years, belly aching to get out of that place. And God said, look, I've got a land I want to take you to. This is, so 400 years before they came out of the land, God knows they're down there in Egypt. And God has a, he's got a land prepared for them. The promised land. But he says, uh, well, wait a minute, God, you got that land. We want out of here. No, he said, no, listen to me. He says, no, I can't let you out of there just yet. 
Well, why, God, can't you let us out? He says, the people in the land where I want to send you aren't sinning enough yet. Did you hear that? They're not sinning enough. Because when God brings them out of there, what are these people going to do to those people in the land? They're going to kill everything there. But so they get them out of the, so they get them out of Egypt. And they get up here in the wilderness, and what are they doing? They're belly aching, moaning and groaning. And he said, and the children of Israel said to them, "Would be to God that we had died at the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full." For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a, a certain rate. Of, now better watch this. God says, I want you to go out and gather a certain rate every day. Now what that means is, he says, Steve, I know you're hungry, but I'm going to provide food for you. When I drop it on the ground out there, I want you to go out and pick up five pieces. Take it back. You're going to eat. Now, watch what happens with this heaven. It says, uh, said, uh, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now, what that means, Marshall, is this. I'm going to give you an illustration. God says, Marshall, go out and pick up five pieces of bread. Now, what happens is, he said, I'm going to be looking because I want to find out if you're willing to obey me. And so, Cody goes out and he says, how many, Lord? And he said, five. And he said, Cody says, one, two, three, four. There are five. I've got five, Lord. Now, Jim comes along and says, how many, Lord? You say that's five. Okay, I have five. And Jim says, one, two, three, four, five. I got six. God said, listen to what he said. He said that I may prove, prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. That means what I'm telling you to do. And it shall come to pass on that sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in and it shall be twice as much as they as they gather daily. So God says, hey, you go out and get something. He's a few days from now. He said, going to be twice that much. Okay. And Moses and Moses and Aaron sent to the, the children of Israel at even. That means at even time. Then you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. Yes, yeah, so he didn't bring out her to die. And in the morning, in the morning, then you shall see the glory of the Lord. For that he for that he heareth your he heareth your what he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we? That you may murmur against us? He said, The Lord hears, and you're murmuring against him. And if you're murmuring against him, what makes you what, why are you murmuring against me? Aaron and me, we didn't do anything. God told, told us, come down there and bring these people out of there. We did just what God wanted you to do. So then in verse 9, he says, And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, speaking to them, saying, at even, that's at evening time, you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at evening, in the evening, the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay on the lay was gone up, and when the dew that lay on the ground was gone up, Behold, upon the face of the wilderness, they lay a small round, there lay a small round thing, a small, as small as a hoar frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, it's manna, it's manna. For they wist not, they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Now watch this. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, 
How much is it? How much can you eat? And Omer for every man, that's a certain measure, according to the number of your persons. Okay, you're going to gather every man according to his eating. And Omer for every man, according to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them, for them which are in your tents. Okay, Daddy, go out there and gather up enough for all your family to eat. It says, and when they did meet it with an Omer, they went out and gathered what they're supposed to do. He gathered much more. He that gathered much more had nothing over. Now let me say that again. And when he, and when they did meet meet it with an Omer. He that gathered much, much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. Lord, they had enough. They gathered every man according to his eating. Then it says, and Moses said, let no man leave, leave of it till the morning. Now, what, now listen to this. He said, and let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some some of them left of it until the morning. See, in other words, when he says back here, let no man leave of it till the morning. That means eat everything you got. Don't leave anything around here. But then it says, notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses. They didn't listen. But some of them left of it. They didn't eat it all. They left it there till the morning. And what did it do? It bred worms and it stank. And Moses, and Moses was wroth. He was angry with them. And they gathered it every morning. So they did the same thing every morning. Every man according to his eating. When the sun waxed hot, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted, okay? Now, what we see here in this passage is the people of Israel murmuring, complaining all the time. Now, let's look at Numbers 20, 14, 26. It says, and the, the Lord spake unto Moses and, and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation? which murmur against me. Now, this, this is a separate, section, a separate incident. And what are they doing? They're still murmuring, okay? He said, I've heard the murmurings of your children of Israel, which they murmur against. Who are they murmuring against? They are murmuring against God. They murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. What I hear you saying to me, I'm going to do this to you. Watch what he says. He said, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. I mean, they're going to die. Why? Because they're murmuring. God has a plan for their life. He says, and all that were there, and all that were, all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from now watch this. Oh, goodness gracious. Look at verse 29 again. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, however many there were, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless you shall not come into the land. Listen, what are they doing? He said they've been, they've been in Egypt for 400 years. A slaves to Pharaoh. We want out of here. God said, finally, 400 years later, he said, it's time to move. Get them out of here, Moses. He gets them out, comes across the Red Sea, get into the wilderness, and this trek across the wilderness, oh my goodness, they've got problems. Uh, they, they don't have enough to eat. They can't keep their mouth shut. They're complaining about everything that's going on. And so he said in this verse, watch this, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. That means they're going to die in the wilderness. And if they die in the wilderness, they're not going to get to the promised land. They're not going to get there. So he says, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years, that just take the whole shebang. How many are there? Everybody over 20 years of age. Listen then. From 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make, make you, you dwell therein, except Caleb, the son of Jehuna, and Joshua, the son of Nun. You know why? You know, what, you know why Joshua and Caleb are mentioned here? Joshua and Caleb, when they went in, you remember when they went in, took, 10 spies went in? 10 spies went in and well, they got over there and it's, God, they sent 10 spies in the Jordan area. Go over there and see what's there because we're going, we're going in there, but go over and take a look and see what's there. Sent 10 spies. 
they came back and all but two of them said, oh, we can go in, we can't go in. Listen, they've already seen how many, how many miracles in, in Egypt. How many miracles on the way from, from Egypt across the Red Sea into the wilderness, the number of miracles. And they get up and say, oh my goodness, we can't go, we can't go in there. But Joshua and Caleb, you know what they said? Yes, we can do it. That's uh, that, what's his name from Ukraine right now, the head of Ukraine? He said, yeah, we can do it. Yeah. yeah. He said, I don't need a ride, I need bullets. Okay. So he said, your carcasses will be spread there. Everybody 20 years of age and older. And then verse 30, he says, doubtless, you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make, make you dwell therein, except Caleb and Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, again, murmuring. Number 17, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel and take, take of one Take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers. Now stop and listen to this again. Here's what's going to happen. God spoke to Moses, speaks to Moses. He said, I want you to go out there and speak to the children of Israel. Now what we have are different groups of people, leaders out there. He says, and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers. In other words, where, what, what, what group are you in? And they've got all these groups out. He said, I want you to get a rod from this one, a rod from this one, a rod from this one. And he said, I want you to take those and do something with them. Take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their father. So each, each group is going, to get, is going to get a rod from them. And of all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, 12 rods. You remember the 12 tribes of Israel? I want you to get 12 rods out there. And then I want you to do something on those 12 rods. He said, I want you to write every man's name upon his rod. In other words, write the name of the leader on that thing. Then he says, and thou shalt write Aaron's name, Aaron's name, because Aaron, listen, Aaron is going to be the high priest. And he said, I want you to put Aaron's name on one of those rods. And see what happened here is the people didn't want Aaron. They're going to murmur against this guy. And God says, okay, let's see. I've found a way here to show them who, I, who, I, who I'm choosing, choosing. And not who they choose, but who I'm choosing. So he said, take Aaron's name and put it on the rod. On the rod of Levi. Now remember, Levi doesn't have any property. He doesn't have any property. So take Aaron's name and put his, on, put his name on Levi's rod. It says, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their father. So he got these 12 rods. He says, and thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony, he says, where I will meet with you. So we're going to take these 12 rods and we'll put them in the, in the, in the place of the congregation before the testimony. He says, and it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you, Moses. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, for each prince one, according to their father's houses, even 12 rods. So they've got these 12 rods now, and God says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You put, you put the name of the, the, head of the head of the tribe there uh, on that rod, put them in there and put them in a certain religious place over here, and we're going to see what happens to them. And I'll tell you, one of those is going to bloom and the one that blooms is has the name the name that's on that that's going to be the head that I'm that I'm appointing. Okay, now what they wanted they wanted somebody else, but God's going to show them who He wants. So in verse six He says, "And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, for each prince one according to their fathers' houses, even twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron was among their rods. The rod of Aaron was among the rods." Aaron's name is on Levi's rod, okay? And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow, the next day, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron from the, for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. It's overnight. <laughs> and, Moses brought, and Moses brought out all the rods before the Lord, and to the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony. Now what happened, they found out, they found, they, they went in and got those rods, brought them back out and showed them which one had been, had been, uh, been, uh, had been blossomed, okay? And now that they know who, who the chief is, they know they knew this is God's man who's gonna be the high priest and lead him. He said, okay, now I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to take Aaron's rod. I want you to go back in and put it back in there where he just came out. Take him back in there. So Moses did so. And as the Lord commanded him, he so he did. And the children of Israel, now see what happened. They didn't want Aaron. But they're gonna to have to go into this tabernacle place. They're gonna to have to go in there to worship. But they don't want Aaron. They had somebody else. And here's what God's going to tell them. And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Whosoever cometh, whosoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Shall we be consumed with dying? Now, the idea here is this, that once they realized that this was God's choice, and he takes that he takes that that rod back in there. If they go in there now and violate his plan, they're going to die. Simply because they're opposing him. Now, in Acts chapter six, verse one, we see more murmuring. And in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Now, let me tell you what this is. You got two sets of you got two sets of Jews. One speaks, one speaks the Jewish language and the other Jews speak Greek. And so what we have there arose a murmuring of the Grecian, the Grecian, uh, Grecians against the Hebrews. That means the Greek speaking Jews have a problem. Now watch this, the Greek speaking Jews are disliked by the Jewish speaking Jews, okay? So what we got is we got, we've got this, this clash between them. And so now what happens is the, the Jews who speak uh, with their Jewish language, uh, they're going to deal with these Greek-speaking Jews in a certain way. In those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, we, we find a lot of people being becoming believers, said there arose a murmuring of the Greek-speaking Jews against the Hebrews who spoke Jewish, the Jewish language. And here's what they were speak, here's what the problem was. Because the Jew, the, the Greek-speaking Jews their widows were being neglected in the daily ministration. In other words, they weren't getting enough to eat. Then the 12 called the multitude, these 12 disciples then called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Now, let me point out something here. When I read that again, I thought, good gracious, this is exactly what happens many times in the denominational entity. What do you do? You hire a pastor, he cuts the grass, he mow, he, he washes the windows, he sweeps the floors, he empties the, empties the waste paper basket, he visits your home, he goes to the hospital. What, what is he supposed to be doing? He's supposed to be studying and teaching. And so he says, in verse three, wherefore the uh, he said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. You got all these people out there and need something to eat, but they need somebody to serve the tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. What's the business? Uh, of cooking a meal and serving it, okay? He said, but we will give we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the saying, the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, men full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Proscorus and Nicaran, uh, Nic uh, Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Now, what in, the, in these four points, these four passages of Scripture, what is, the, what is the point? What are these people doing? Murmuring, 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 murmuring. And now we get into Philippians 2.14, 4, and Paul looks at the Philippians, and he says, look, I see all this stuff you're going through. I, re I realize the persecution that you're under. He said, but look, he said, you're, you're need, you need to work out your own salvation because it is God who is working in you to influence you to do 
do what he wants to do, do his will. So Philippians 2.14 says then to you and me, to you and me then, seeing all this that happened back there, he said, I want you, listen, I want you to meet the circumstances of every day and do it without murmuring. I'm asking you, what are you doing with the circumstances of your life? Be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. If you're murmuring, you got a problem. And you just take a look back and see how God dealt with the Jews who murmured. There are illustrations there for you and me. Now, instead of starting verse uh, starting verse 15, we only have about five minutes left. So here's what I want to do. We just gave you four verses, four passages of scripture or illustrations about God's people murmuring about the plan that he has for their life. Now, what I want to do now is I want to show you, I want to give you, I'm not going to be able to give it all to you, but I'm going to give you 10 more illustrations of the Israelites testing God on certain occasions. For example, when the Israelites are trapped between Pharaoh's army behind them and the Red Sea in front of them, remember that? Come out of Egypt, they get up to the Red Sea, oh my goodness, how are we going to cross that, how are we going to cross this, this big body of water, and wait a minute, here the horses pounding on the ground behind me. Here comes Pharaoh. We're going to die. We're going to die. So when the Israelites were trapped between Pharaoh's army behind them and the Red Sea in front of them, they cried out to the Lord and complained to Moses, saying, was it because there were no graves in Egypt? Now, they, there's, no land, there's no place down in Egypt where they have land where they can bury the dead anymore. We got they, they, no more no more property to bury the dead. So it says, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have led us out into this wilderness to die? Didn't we tell you, listen to this, please, 400 years of, of trying to get out of there. Didn't we tell you when we were in Egypt, Moses, to leave us alone so that we would continue serving the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to have died back there than to die out here. What are they doing? They're complaining. Listen to this. After the Israelites had been in the wilderness of Shur for three days without finding water, they came to a place called Marah. There is water in Marah. Oh, yes. We have no water, but look, we're at Marah. Here is water. But what, what happened? Said the water was so bitter, no one could drink it. So what happened? So the people complained against Moses again. We need a drink. You brought us to water, but it's so bitter we can't drink it, Moses. Then on the 15th, on the on the on day 15 of the second month after the departure from Egypt, the Israelites grow hungry and complain against Moses and Aaron, saying, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord of the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and we ate the bread to the full. Now you brought us out in the wilderness to kill us all with hunger. Four, when God starts sending the Israelites manna to eat every morning, Moses warns them against trying to save some for the daily portion and eat it on the following day. Despite the warning, however, some of them try to try it, uh, try it and learn that the manna breeds worms and starts stinking if left overnight. One more. Also concerning the gathering of manna, Moses tells them that they should gather twice as much as they as usual in the morning before each Sabbath morning, because God won't send the manna on the Sabbath. Still, despite the fact the Sabbath is to be a day of rest, some of the Israelites go out and gather manna on the first Sabbath morning, following that command. And what do? And of course, when they went out, they didn't find anything because it wasn't there. Now. What's the moral of this story tonight? Don't murmur. Don't murmur. Listen, every, and yet every circumstance of life that, that we face, every circumstance of life comes from God. And that circumstance is either because you did something wrong or because he's allowed it to strengthen you. So under either condition, Stop complaining. Stop griping. Stop bellyaching. 
Now, here's I'm, I'm, I'm going to read these words, one, the whole set of words here, because maybe you don't know. Maybe you say, I forgot what those words meant. Well, let's give, let me give them to you again here. And I'm going to close. Here it is. Murmuring and disputing. Here it is. Complaints. Griping. Grumbling. Argument. Disputing. Dissension. Doubt. Motives. Opinions. Reasonings. Speculations. Thoughts. Whatever it was that you were thinking. These. These. Those words embrace the idea of murmuring and disputing. Do keep on doing all things without murmuring and disputing. Father, listen, this message tonight, it is so real. It is so real. This is what the Christian way of life is all about. And I'm going to pray, Father, that every one of us will look at our own life. Are we murmuring? Are we complaining? Are we doubting? Are we grumbling? Are we arguing? Are we disputing? Is there dissension? Are you doubting? Do you have an opinion? What's going on, Father? Your will is perfect. It is clear in the word. and the angelic conflict, we're being called to that word to be light in darkness out there in the public square. Thank you, Father, for your mission. Thank you for your plan. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. I'm praying, Father, that every one of us will take a deep look at ourselves tonight and ask ourselves, is this us? And if it is, it's time to change. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless all of you. Good day, and we'll be back this coming Sunday morning at the regular time. Thanks for being with me tonight. Good night.